Ed Christie uh, was my great, great uncle. This is where uh, he built his house. Ned was not, from what I've heard, Ned was not a, a mean person because he, uh, he was actually um, a counselor, a tribal counselor, as we know him today, for a Cherokee Nation, along with his dad. So they had the Cherokee Nation in mind every time they uh, went to ta travel to Tahlequah. And back then it was either walking or by horse. And it took a couple of days to get up there and it was just, he was camping out and he was at the, in the wrong place at the wrong time. In the spring of 1887, the, uh, the Cherokee Female Seminary had burned and so there was a council meeting that was called here in Tahlequah. And so that's why Ned was in Tahlequah. So he was in town and he was known to, to drink. And so he had went and, and got some alcohol. And so at this point is when the story gets a little blurred because he passes out, he says, at by the creek. And then he wakes up the next morning to find out that he's um, wanted for the murder of a deputy marshal, Dan Maples. So uh, Ned goes back to Wahilla and he's got a lot of people who are supporting him, who are lookouts for him. Um, marshals, they're gonna come and go and try to apprehend him. And um, he pretty much spent, you know, the next few years um, hid out in his home in, in Wahilla. And at one point the marshals do come and they burn his house down. And so he rebuilds it. And what he rebuilds is a double walled cabin. So it's got little portholes in it. It also had some sand in between it, so it was a very secure structure. He was hidden in plain sight, you know. He did everything he wanted to do, and he was in, I think he had people that would uh, warn him. They had like signals to warn him that there was a marshal around. And uh, during all that time, anytime some, something happened anywhere throughout Cherokee tr country, the uh, people blamed Ned. There's one instance where he was accused of murdering Deputy Marshal U.S. Uh, U.S. Deputy Marshal Bass Reeves, and Bass shows up two weeks later, um, and he's got a bunch of prisoners, and he had been in the Chickasaw Nation. So anytime something uh, came up with any crime, uh, Ned was was the one that was getting blamed for it. So all the while, he's up at his house in in Wahilla. And during all this time, the reason why he was hidden was he was innocent, and he knew it and the people around him helping, helped him to survive. So it's been almost five years at this point. Uh, there was a new marshal who came, um, who was appointed there at Fort Smith. His name was uh, Jacob Yos, and he thought this had all went on long enough. Uh, we have letters written, and I've got right here with me, that are written from Yos to the Attorney General of the United States saying, you know, here's a deputy marshal, Dan Maples has been killed. We want $500 reward to help you know, catch this guy, uh, Christy. Um, and then at the same time, you've got right after that, maybe even in the same envelope, uh, you've got a letter from Judge Parker asking for $1,000. Well, technically that's really not his job to be asking for reward money, uh, but apparently he felt pretty strongly about it. And this, had, at this point, that had gone on for several years they were chasing, and that wasn't a, you know, a week later kind of thing. Uh, if you look at the newspapers that read at the time, they were talking about his, not only Christy, Ned, uh, but some of his family members that were involved with shootings and, and, and death and murder and things, things, things like that. So the, the gang that he was running, which, you know, is wildly untrue. Uh, but then again, that played up and they're reading these newspapers and it's not, it's not just a Fort Smith or an Arkansas newspaper. These are newspapers from, you know, the, the, the from, from Benita and, and, and more than that. So you've got this, it's, it's literally fake news. They were playing up to that mythology. And if you read some of the newspapers, it reads like a dime store novel. Um, you know, he's taking over towns and shooting, murdering people that never happened. And so they send a posse out of um, at least at least two dozen men to finally try to apprehend him. And it takes over a day. Um, the, the shooting happens and it stops. Um, they end up bringing in a cannon. Yeah, they used dynamite. They used a cannon. They brought a cannon in from Fort Smith, Arkansas. So um, traveling with the cannon and all that, it, it took some time to actually come up here for these guys. You know, you have to travel sl slow when you're carrying dynamite and also the cannon. That, that attack was, uh, from what I hear, was horrible because this was one man and he knew he was innocent, but he was fighting for his life too. 
Uh, so apparently the, the, the plan went in not only to, to go in there with a bunch of guys, which is dangerous enough when you're dealing with a dozen well-armed deputy marshals, which are, you know, nobody to be scoffed at, uh, but then throw the fact on that they had dynamite packed with them, which is pretty uncommon, uh, and the fact they had a small cannon uh, with them, which was, again, extremely uncommon. I've never heard anything close to that, either of those uh, methods. Um, but they had apparently surrounded his cabin in, in, uh, in, in the night, called out for surrender, shot Arch Wolf. He goes back into the house, uh, and then the shootout goes on for quite some time. At some point after they shot the cannon enough times that they ruined the cannon and nothing happens, um, they found out that you, it's, it's hard to shoot against wood uh, with a thick wood with a cannonball. That's not what cannons are meant to do. But then, of course, they go in with dynamite. And they used that and rolled it up on the carriage to Ned's home. And then that's when they were able to catch his cabin on fire. And so <clears throat> he comes out, he knows his time's up. He had been out of ammunition for a little while. And um, that's when they, they kill him. From the stories that I've heard and pictures that I've seen, um, just to show everybody they got Ned Christie, the, the infamous, famous Ned Christie. Uh, they, they put his body on a door just to show everybody they actually got him. And, um, and you'll see lots of pictures now where he's propped up on the, the courthouse. Uh, marshals come and take photographs with him and he was up on display the entire day his body was. His dad had to go claim his body and bring it back. That picture was in the museum at Fort Smith for a long time. And we finally got him to take it down. The family uh, finally had, uh, you know, it took a while, but they finally took that picture down. And um, it, I have tears in my eyes when I think about it. But it was just um, to think how um, people of um, the marshals and um, the deputies and people, um, that were after him, even though he knew he was innocent. In the early 1900s, a man comes forward by the name of Dick Humphrey. He was a Cherokee freedman. And uh, he did an interview, it was in the Daily Oklahoman, and he talks about uh, that he witnessed the murder of Deputy Marshal Dan Maples, and that it was the trainer who had did, did the killing, um, not Ned Christie. Uh, this is Jim Crow era, so he was afraid to come forward at this time. He was a like I said, a Cherokee freedman. So uh, that's why it was so many years after the fact that he finally comes forward. And just to hear that he was declared innocent years later, you know, which we knew that was true. I, I mean, everybody knew it was true that he was innocent. He cared for the Cherokee people when he worked for the Cherokee tribe as a tribal counselor along with his dad. And he, he fought for the Cherokee people when he was on the council. And um, that's kind of the stuff that uh, when I think about it in, in like today's world, uh, I want to be out there helping people, my people. And that's what Ned was doing. Ned was uh, very well liked in the Cherokee community. I mean, he was a blacksmith and people really um, admired him and what he stood for as far as Cherokee sovereignty. And so he earned a lot of respect because of that. And a lot of people will call him one of our last great warriors when it comes to um, trying to fend off the federal government. Even though people um, put that title on him as an outlaw, he was, an, he was not an outlaw. And I don't think any of the family members ever think about him being an outlaw. He was a good person. 